Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you'll admit after listening to speakers before me that there's not much I can say. I, I, I must tell you the, the member from Viewfort North was simply inspiring. And he spoke he spoke about being excited about the future. And he got me excited. I even forgot that I was the Minister of Tourism who had to speak on the motion. I was really caught up in his presentation and a member from Barbono, South East, Castries North, you know, Denry. Um, even a member from Suzel um, raised a couple of very valuable points and I will touch on a couple of them. Um, even the Attorney General next to me wanted to stand up and speak, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Um, you know, <laughs> even an honourable member. But I want to start off, Mr. Speaker, by first of all thanking the Prime Minister and my colleagues for the support that they have given to this resolution. And especially, Mr. Speaker, that they are all wed wedded in the idea that we have an opportunity in St. Lucia to transform the tourism industry to bring greater benefits to St. Lucians like never before. It is a journey, it is a vision that started many years ago. And a lot of what I believe in and I reflect on actually started many years ago when the present Prime Minister was the Minister of Tourism and the member from Vifort South himself was Prime Minister. So many of those ideas and approaches came out of a very clear understanding of what tourism um, should represent to us as St. Lucians. And you've seen a manifestation of that dream and that vision, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, we need to, to step back a bit and reflect on some comments made you know, by the, other, the opposition, Mr. Speaker, and especially the leader of the opposition. Because I really wish she would be here now to listen to the presentations made by the various members and for him to make his contribution. And it was quite remarkable, Mr. Speaker, and disturbing at the same time, Mr. Speaker, that even when his attempt to play the cat and mouse game did not succeed, and the Prime Minister Mike went on before his, and the Speaker called on the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister had the graciousness to stand up and say, I'm going to yield and let you speak. But he did not even take up the offer, which tells me there was no sincerity in speaking to the issue, that it was going to be a performance, it was going to be drama and show, and not substance, Mr. Speaker. And even when he was told, I am going to yield, and the Speaker cautioned and sanctioned that he will not accept such behavior you know, as, as Speaker. But the Prime Minister yielded to give him a chance to speak. And the Prime Minister said clearly, I am letting you speak because I know I have a chance to answer you. So no matter what you say, I will be able to answer you. Why did he not speak? And I wanted him to present his own contribution on this motion, Mr. Speaker. And I'll tell you why. Because he started off by saying to us, none of us have ever been self-employed and we don't understand business and we don't know business in this, in this chamber that you know, we have no plan, we have no understanding, we don't know what we're about. And I sat there listening to him. This was the same member who came into this chamber and said that he's going to be a CEO prime minister. He's going to run the country like a business because he had the most business experience in the chamber. But watch what happened with the CEO Prime Minister. The company went bankrupt. The share value dropped significantly. And Mr. Speaker, watch where we found ourselves. And other members have already given, you know, a, an oversight of where he has taken this country. But this is the CEO Prime Minister. It is amazing how he thinks. He wants to convince us that he understands business, he knows the right model to do things, he's critical of the CIP and some of the changes we are making, but yet he was Prime Minister for the disastrous range um, issue. But how could you have been so wrong, cause such a scandal of the, the, the range matter, and still believe that your approach, your model, is the right one? 
and that you have the knowledge and you have the understanding, he still wants to convince us that DSH is right and proper and is the model we should follow. He, he stands up there even today and wants to argue about all the glorious things about DSH. Where are the signs of any success at DSH? Where, where, where are they? Where are they? How do you want to convince us that you're such a success and that you know it all and we know nothing? Where are the signs? Where is it? And Mr. Speaker, we can go on and on and each member can point out to you evidence of the failure of the last government. But he wants to stand and to pontificate and arrogate upon himself the right to judge us and to say we know not what we're doing and that he knows what has to be done. You see, one of the things we said when I became Minister of Tourism is that we're not going to come every month and boast about numbers. That was a practice of the past. You'd recall every sitting of parliament, a particular representative who sat across there would stand up and boast about numbers and numbers and arrivals. And we said, not that numbers are not important. Numbers are important because we want to bring visitors to the country. We want visitors to come in and spend in our country. But what's more important for us is how we structure this tourism industry that it can reflect the best of our people, the best of who we are, and for us to ensure that St. Lucians benefit from the tourism industry more than ever. And we are very clear. We want more St. Lucians to participate in the tourism industry and more St. Lucians to own the tourism industry. And there's a simple logic for this. And I keep saying it every time I get an opportunity to speak. We want foreign investment. We want the present players to earn more than what they are earning. But we want the industry to get bigger so that more solutions can participate in it and earn as well. That is fundamental. Think about it. The mountains, the rivers, the trails, the beaches. That's a common heritage of St. Lucia. No hotel owns that. The people own it. All the warmth of our people that is so attractive, and, and the member from Gifford North put it so well, we're not a people of violence, we are people of love. We're the world's leading honeymoon destination for a reason. We know how to seduce people. We know how to show romance and love and be welcoming. That's who we are. Mr. Speaker, stop smiling. But that's exactly who we are. And therefore, these are the natural resources we have. And who should enjoy the majority or the greater part of those natural resources but the people of the country? So we have to design a tourism industry where when investors come in and they invest their money, they get a fair return on their investment and they are satisfied with their business endeavors. But we must make sure that our people can boast that this tourism industry is develop, deve um, delivering benefits to them. They can enjoy civilized standards of living and how they can see their children go to universities from their hard work. They can see opportunities for their children within this tourism industry. So, Mr. Speaker, next Tuesday we'll come back to this house to present the Tourism Development Bill. And then, Mr. Speaker, we'll have a lot more to say about how we are restructuring this industry. But an essential comp comp component of this is what we are debating today, the Community Tourism Bill, Community Tourism Projects. This borrowing is about enhancing the capacity of St. Lucians to benefit from the tourism industry. This is what it is about. And Mr. Speaker, the member from EcoSouth is not here. And the Prime Minister and my colleagues, we've always said, you know, that we want to stay focused on the task that the St. Lucian citizenry has given us, and that is to transform this country and to do away with the mess of the past. But if you're going to speak about community tourism, you must start off, Mr. Speaker, as far back as 1997 with heritage tourism. And Mr. Speaker, you must thank all those who came before us and contributed to shaping the landscape that exists now. 
you must say a special thank you to persons, the former Prime Minister, the former, the present Prime Minister, Mr. Felix Finister, um, Nigel Michel, who passed away, so many individuals who contributed, the present PS in the ministry, so many individuals who contributed to, modest, to introducing in St. Lucia the concept of heritage tourism, the concept of people's tourism, Mr. Speaker. It is not a new concept. It's not new. What we're seeing is an evolution of that. We are taking it to a different dimension, Mr. Speaker. But it is not entirely new. We won't pretend, Mr. Speaker, that we are the, the originators of all ideas and we know all things. We're not. We're not, Mr. Speaker. But let's go back, Mr. Speaker, a few years ago where the last government decided that they wanted to take further action, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Kenny Anthony, when he was Prime Minister, and this morning he referred to the ORTCP, which was a regional tourism improvement project funded under, um, by the World Bank together with a number of OECS countries. And part of that provided for increasing the product stock of community tourism, part of it, and I'll come to some of it in a bit. But a decision was taken to advance the discussion on community tourism and, of course, to strengthen the institutional capacity. The last government decided to use $5 million EC from the Republic of China and Taiwan to fund community tourism projects. But rather than to do it the proper way, same individual who says, we have no plan, we don't know how to do things, we don't know how to execute, and they are the ones that can execute, you know. They're still boasting about that. Decided to spend the money on ancillary, souffre, and grossly. But did not put in place the institution, did not put in place the legislative framework, and did not put in place the policy framework to guide that development. But they spent the $5 million, but we're not going to go back into all the details of it. Um, at the appropriate time, those matters can be dealt with by you know, responsible agencies, Mr. Speaker. But $5 million was spent, and they took a decision to also get a loan from the CARICOM Development Fund of $9 million for on lending for persons who want to invest in community tourism. And of course, a grant, Mr. Speaker, to help set up the institutions. Of course, one can always ask the question, why you want to spend money on projects when you have no institution, no staff, no oversight, no laws, no policy framework, nothing, but you're spending $5 million already, Mr. Speaker. That was a decision taken then. We did it slightly differently. We ensured that we put in place the legislative framework. We ensured that we put in place the institution. We employed the staff. And then we are going to take off, Mr. Speaker. So what you are seeing, Mr. Speaker, is the first stage of that takeoff, Mr. Speaker, to get it right, to make sure that all the elements are in place. And we are now going to be building the, 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 the product stock that is needed, Mr. Speaker. So, when you look at the borrowing, which is the second tranche of borrowing from the Car CARICOM Development Fund, always bear in mind that we already took a loan of $9 million um, to provide loans to persons who want to invest in community tourism. But we decided very early, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to change the name from village tourism to community tourism. And I've dealt with this in this house before. When you speak of village tourism in St. Lucia, in the context of St. Lucia, what are you talking about? Somebody in Babono wants to start a project and they'll speak of a, a village tourism project in Babono or in Lafag. And our view was that's not village, that's community. We're really talking about a commonality of identity, of purpose, and of, you know, of experience. The notion of village does not resonate with that. Village in the context of St. Lucia, the historical context, and like the member from Dufort North put it, everything really has, things get meaning because of the context in which they are located. And that's a powerful way of describing it. Maybe it's sociolinguistics we have to go into. That phenomenon has no meaning if you don't understand the context in which they exist. So when you speak of 
village tourism in Peru. People cannot associate with that, but when you say community tourism, the people of Peru as a community can rally themselves around that. We were told that it was going to be franchises and that communities and projects would have franchises. When you speak of franchise, they think of Kentucky and um, Subway. That's what a franchise is. We said it would be better to say a partnership. That's, that's our cultural context. You form a partnership with the community. You're not selling a franchise to them. That's not what it is about. So we made changes in name for sure, for sure, like the, the member from Microsoft said. But it is more than just name. It has substance behind it because it creates an understanding of purpose. It creates an expectation of what it is we're going to deliver. So, Mr. Speaker, we did make some changes, for sure. I'll admit that, but I believe it's for the betterment of, of the program, Mr. Speaker. So, we also made a third fundamental change. In the previous configuration, there was going to be loans made to applicants. And we thought we wanted to, to, to reflect on this. If you want communities, Mr. Speaker, you want individuals to benefit, some of them cannot qualify for the kind of loans we're talking about. So we had to decide to have a very low interest rate to be able to make it attractive, but also to give grants to individuals. So if you, in the case of the member from Castro Central, wants to start a project that is $90,000, you can take a $60,000 60, loan, and he can get a $30,000 grant because he may not be able to sustain a loan of, okay, well, uh, all right, yeah, um, of, of $90,000, what not. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, we then, and the Prime Minister led on, on this, to get monies from from central government uh, for the National Economic Fund to actually provide resources to the Community Tourism Agency so applicants can get both grants and, lo and, and loans as well to be able to make it attractive for them. Because we want ordinary solutions who do not normally qualify for commercial loans, but who has an exciting idea, an exciting experience to be able to be part of the tourism industry. We did not believe that community tourism, because of its very nature, its very concept, should be restricted to only those who can qualify for commercial loans. So we introduced the grant and loan component, Mr. Speaker. So now we have all the elements in place, but we had some challenges and some setbacks. And again, Mr. Speaker, in our you know, progress as we move forward, we learn and we adjust it. When we issued a call for ideas and for projects, we got so many exciting ideas. And persons went to the agency with ideas that they wanted and submitted it. And then when they asked them, do you own the land you want to create the experience? They did not own the land. Do you have drawings? They did not have drawings. Did you have DCE approval? They did not have DCE approval. So, so many solutions came forward with exciting ideas, but at different stages of development. So again, now we had to recalibrate, and for us to decide, we had to start from scratch with most of the applications. And then for us to develop the idea. And I must say, not everyone is as, how you call it, um, as, as expeditious as a member from Castle Central. But when he came up with an idea for Serenity Park, within a couple of months he had drawings, costing, submission to DC, and he's ready to go. But not everybody um, has the same capacity or the same um, speed that, that, that he has. So we've had you know, slight delays in certain communities because we, the institution itself now has to provide greater support to individuals who have ideas and you know um, some really fantastic you know proposals on on the table so in the next few weeks we'll start launching some of the programs that we have approved we have funded and have started and you will see mr speaker just over a year after or just about a year after we started the institution we can start formally announcing projects that st lucians have have come up with for community experiences. But that's just a start, because this borrowing that we're discussing is about the next wrong. 
of projects that will be implemented. And we have another round coming, and we'll have more coming, Mr. Speaker, because this is so important. This is about ensuring that when visitors come to St. Lucia, every single dollar, more of that dollar must be spent in St. Lucia and stay in St. Lucia. We cannot allow the tourist dollar to leave St. Lucia. We have to make some of it stay in St. Lucia and be enjoyed by St. Lucians. So the member from Castries East would have pointed out that in this borrowing, we have four projects that have already been identified and approved by the CARICOM Development Fund. The first one is the Denry Fish Fiesta. And the member from Denry South spoke of the Denry Fish Fiesta. And he spoke of the history of it and its importance to the community. And therefore, we know what happened under the last dispensation, the last government, the last parliamentary rep, and that this experience was allowed to wallow and to disappear. But it is important for persons on the East Coast, for the community of Denry, and for so many St. Lucians who enjoyed, you know, the, the fish fiesta. And therefore, provisions is made to bring it back and to restore it um, to its former glory. The Seamoss experience, if you just reflect on the, the success that the chocolate experience has had in St. Lucia, whether at Caco Setlisi, whether at Hotel Chocola, or other places in St. Lucia, where we've now become so well known, and those of you would have seen the CBS clipping of the boasting of St. Lucia and for his chocolate and for the celebration of Valentine's Day, you would understand how far reaching the reputation of St. Lucia for quality chocolates um, is. And we believe, and from what we know about our St. Lucia and Simos, we have an equally attractive product that we can create a special experience for. And a member for Miku North boasts that the best Simos comes out of the Prale B. I cannot comment on where the best Seamoss, um, I, I, I don't know whether it is from Savans Bay, um, whether it is from Fordor, or where it is from, or, you know, other parts of, of, of St. Lucia. <laughs> but we want to create, with the, the parliamentary rep, a special experience in the Prale area, a Seamoss experience where one can witness from, from the sea what's done, you know, to um, grow the CMOS all the way to the manufacturing of the various byproducts of the CMOS. And I know his team is working very hard to develop the concept that will, that will come with this. And of course, what makes it even more exciting in the Prale area is we in advanced discussions and a developer has already submitted plans for the revival of the Le Paradis project, Mr. Speaker. And once that project, Mr. Speaker, is revived and the CMOS experience can be established, that course, Mr. Speaker, will once again become a hive of activity, Mr. Speaker. Mention was made of the Mon Lebai, and the member from Castries North reminded us of his boyhood days um, at the Mon Lebai, and he spoke of selling um, trinkets and other apps pieces of art to visitors when they came in. He didn't tell us of the late night watching the stars, you know, at the morning late by. Um, although the member of Castle Central said he passed him many a times, you know, at the morning late by. Um, but for those of you whom may have known him, he was very adventurous as a young man, so he knows the area very well, Mr. Speaker. But the morning late by, Mr. Speaker, is a, no, is a very is very well known. It's one of the first rest um, stops out of the city and just before you get to the city. It's probably the most famous lay-by in, in St. Lucia. And we all know the last um, lay-by was not structurally sound. We had to demolish it and a new one will be built. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, a lot of effort has gone into designing the new Mon lay-by and hopefully in the next month or so, once the money's become available, we will start work on the Mon Lebai to have it ready for the next cruise season in October, because the, the, we have the vendors in the temporary area, but we need to make arrangements for them to make sure that they can get back to their normal, um, you know, course of business. And the fourth project under this motion, Mr. Speaker, is the Matters Shrine. And this is our first journey into religious tourism. It's our first journey into that aspect and, and using that aspect of our heritage and our culture to show the best of St. Lucia. And if you only reflect, there are few churches in St. Lucia where 
um, she was uh, Derek Wall, um, Dunstan Sentume, actually painted you know, the Madonas and the reflections of ourselves in our spirituality. Um, the Jack Mel, um, Moshi, um, you know, some of those churches, even the cathedral, these are representations of our spirituality and the church stands at the center of, of, of it, Mr. Speaker. We all knew, we all remember what happened a few years ago outside the cathedral and the loss of life, Mr. Speaker. And we all regret what happened. But it's an opportunity for us to be able, Mr. Speaker, to, to build a shrine for the departed, which is to serve um, the Catholic Church, Mr. Speaker, and who lost their lives because of their faith, Mr. Speaker, that you know, we, we have an opportunity to build a remembrance of them, but at the same time, Mr. Speaker, to say to visitors, you can come and learn about an aspect of our history and you know, what it has meant for, for the church and the impact it has had on the church. So we've been working with the church, the church submitted the idea to us and told us they had an interest in, in, in this project. And we wholeheartedly um, embraced it and supported it. We believe it will add a very valuable you know, component, Mr. Speaker, to um, our tourism product and our community tourism product that visitors can actually um, visit the shrine when it is completed. I've seen the preliminary drawings and it is very excited, very exciting, Mr. Se Mr. Speaker, what um, they are proposing. So th th this um, resolution will provide the resources for those four main projects, Mr. Speaker. But already we are looking to the next rung, Mr. Speaker, of the projects that you know, we have to consider, and all in an attempt to build, Mr. Speaker, greater value in our St. Lucianness, Mr. Speaker, to expose more of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. And the member from Beaufort um, North spoke about the drumming festival, something that he had worked on for many years, had gone dormant and had, was revived last October, Mr. Speaker. And he and I have sat down and we have done some visioning of where we want the drumming festival to go. And we're thinking of a drumming festival that will become the premier drumming festival in this part of, of, of the Antilles, Mr. Speaker. The entire, Mr. Speaker, where, where we can attract drummers from Africa, from South America, from all over to come to St. come to Bellevue, come to Peru, spend the weekend, spend a few days, Mr. Speaker, where they can do workshops and drumming and teach that aspect of our heritage. And of course, to have a full-scale drumming festival, Mr. Speaker. And just imagine that happening in Beaufort North, the growth of Airbnbs as persons who come down will want to look for accommodation, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we all know Beaufort North is probably our most exciting cultural um, community, Mr. Speaker, with Bel Air and um, Cordrill and, and all the other, you know, cultural, you know, uh, <laughs> um, cultural heritage, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, the. The, the, the member from Vifford North submitted a request to actually build amphitheaters, two amphitheaters in the constituency that he can certainly add to, to the cultural experiences that we offer as part of community tourism. They need it because even last year, for us to have the drumming festival, we had to bring in infrastructure. And the infrastructure we had to bring in sometimes can be very sterile, metal stages, and you know um, it doesn't look like what we want. They have an opportunity to design amphitheaters that reflect the cultural heritage. Um, you know, mem the member from Surozel was being teased about whether about building the bridge, or whatnot. But one thing you can say, at least on the bridge, is they sought to have some reflection of the cultural, you know, um, heritage of the region in which a bridge was built. And I think we, that's how we have to move as a country for us to have more reflections of ourselves in our surroundings. And the member from Castle Central knows, I always tell him about the murals that he's painted all over some parts of his constituency to continue to do so, continue to, to, to paint ourselves. Let's look at ourselves on our walls, on our bridges, in our buildings. I know the member from Vivot South always used to have, you know, a big issue with this, that too many ugly buildings have been built in the country and they have no character and they have no personality. And he felt we should have buildings that, that speak of who we are. Because architecture is part of the definition of self and who we are as a people. So, Mr. Speaker, the Viewfort North uh, has put forward proposals and we're looking and I'm in discussions with a member from Castries East about funding for, 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 for that project. In Marshall, the member from Castries says we often forget him, 
but there's an exciting pos um, proposal for an artisan village in the Marshall Market to, to redevelop and redesign the Marshall Market and have an artisan village that will show off the best of craft in St. Lucia in terms of leather work, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, I don't know how many of you all remember many, many years ago, maybe the member from Beaufort South might remember it and maybe Cassius North. Many, many years ago in 1979 when the Labour Party won and this craft market was built was built in the Castries City, um, near the old marketing board in that area there. Um, a craft market was actually built there, where you actually, I, I remember as a young boy walking past that, and you could actually see the craftsmen making sandals, making sandals, belts. Yeah. You bought sandals there, you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, and you could actually go in there, talk about 1979, under the Labour Party then where you could walk in and see the craftsmen making belts, making bags, making um, sandals, and right there, drums, right there in the, the, the leather craft market. <laughs> well, you might, well, come to think of it, you, the member of you thought South probably was involved in that because I think he was a consultant advisor in the Ministry of Education and Culture at that time, no? Um, so he probably would recall some of that. But, but again, that's what we, we want in Marsha, to make it a center for leather craft and for artisan um, displays. And of course, I think the member from Castries East is looking for a place <coughs> to house a uh, still pan site. So um, we, we're certainly going to take that into consideration. Uh, and that is another project that has been um, proposed. Uh, no? A hotel, an Airbnb, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. The, yeah. You know, Mr. Speaker, if you think about it, almost 300,000 persons leave Beaufort and drive up north to various hotels and Airbnbs. And along that route, sometimes they want a place to stop, you know, a place of, to take a drink, you know, to Falco. He said Falco. Um, and we need to start thinking of what are the stops along the route as you tra traverse around St. Lucia. You know, you have the laybys in Denry. We need to upgrade it, make sure it meets certain standards. The Mon Laybay. But we had to think of ancillary. We had to think of canneries. And in Soufre, overlooking the heritage, the Pitors, the heritage yeah. site, there's no lookout there really. There's no vending. There are no toilets. There is no place for somebody to buy something to eat. So you, you drive by and you see persons parking their cars and taking photos, even of the. Um, or you call it the plaque that is there. But if somebody wants to use a restroom, there, there, there are no, no restrooms nearby. There's no way you could buy a souvenir. There's no way you could just decide, let me just have a meal, let me have some Bix and Accra and a little squash. There's none of that. And we are proposing around the island to identify strategic spots where we can build those. The same way you spoke about the bus stops and having the bus stops now becoming uh, sites of commercial activity. So we, we <laughs> so we need to start thinking as you drive around the island, what are the strategic spots? So the Mon, Ancillary, there's talk of the Lacqua Flats, you know, because there's an ex a beautiful view of the valley, the Roseau Valley from, from that area. Um, the Angers Gap, for example, people stop to buy their corn. I think somebody owns the land in that, that area there, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, we, we, we can develop that, that area with a proper stop, Mr. Speaker. So you can literally drive around St. Lucia. Right now, the best bread you can get, and visitors, and I've actually met visitors overseas who have boasted about the bread at Tomazo, that they must have at Tomazo to eat hot local bread. But we should have more of that around the island. So as people move around, they get cassava in canneries, they get hot bread in Tomazo, they might get something else, you know, in another community. So creating more experiences and more opportunities, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member from Castries South East spoke about the hike in trail, Mr. Speaker. How can we develop that to add even greater to our adventure offerings, Mr. Speaker? Um, 
you know, they, they, they quite a few other ideas, Mr. Speaker, in Sufre um, and other parts of, of, of the island where we are receiving proposals and ideas of things. The Monsito in Babono, I believe there's a meeting recently in Babono, and the ministry team went there and they, they, they were boasting to me one of the best views you can ever get, Mr. Speaker, is from that, from that area and that we should do a lookout point there. And some people ask, why lookout points? Why, why you want to do lookout points? Just think of the, the shared photo, the, the, the memories of somebody taking a photo in one of the most picturesque parts of this earth, Mr. Speaker, that they will carry with them wherever they, they, they go. And that, that photo, that memories of St. Lucia. So though those areas and those photos and those um, opportunities we create are valuable, Mr. Speaker. So as we look forward, Mr. Speaker, in Strozel, Mr. Speaker, we actually... No, no, I come into that one. It's something we've been working on. In Strozel, we're actually working on a, a, a craft tour, Mr. Speaker, where we'll have a, a specific designated tour where we visit selected craftspersons who are making cold pots, making baskets, you know, the basket weaving, whatnot, and actually have it as an official tour, Mr. Speaker. And, and think of what that would create for those craft um, you know, people, Mr. Speaker. And we, we've already discussed it, and it's something we're going to work on visiting various waterfalls around St. Lucia. Just imagine somebody getting a special um, prize, an extra day at a hotel or whatever, if you visit how many waterfalls in St. Lucia. So many beautiful and enchanting waterfalls we have in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, that St. Lucians don't even know about. I'm sure a member from Suzel can tell you quite a few because one of his hobbies um, is chasing waterfalls in St. Lucia and rivers, Mr. Speaker. And, and all those you know, experiences are community experiences. They tell of who we are as a people. And for this, Mr. Speaker, this borrowing is another step as we develop St. Lucia, we develop the product landscape, Mr. Speaker. We offer greater opportunities for St. Lucians to own part of the tourism industry and to show off the best of St. Lucia. You know, the member from Castle South, spoke about, and he's right, we shouldn't do it just because of the visitors. We shouldn't do it just because of them. We have to do it because it's necessary. But at the same time, if you know you have visitors coming to your home, you make an extra effort to clean it up and to sort out your house and to make it look more presentable. That's our nature too. Think about the beaches. And that's why the point he made really struck with me, because it is true. But we cannot continue to have our people going to use the beaches and there are no facilities there, no toilets there, no lifeguards. We cannot continue to do it. So we're not doing it just for the tourists, but we're doing it for our people also, Mr. Speaker. So I am pleased to say, Mr. Speaker, that Simple Spark in Grosile is progressing very nicely, Mr. Speaker. And hopefully in the next few months, we'll be able to open Simple Spark in Grosile, Mr. Speaker. We are going to work on a facility at Ragery Beach, Mr. Speaker. It's probably the busiest beach in St. Lucia. Again, you have no toilet facilities there. It's overcrowded during the cruise season. And, you know, it, it is a problem, Mr. Speaker. I know in um, La Clary View, um, VG, well, VG, we already have some toilets there. We have to develop it. In Viewfort, Mr. Speaker, we have to do a lot of work, Mr. Speaker, and we'll have to engage with the parliamentary representative for his vision of what he wants down there and how he wants it um, to develop. But we've already started speaking to a couple of stakeholders on their views as to what we can do. We will be, Mr. Speaker, and I, I want you to take note of it, the Caribbean Jewels Project, Mr. Speaker. This is at Mont Pimad. We're actually going to build with the developer. The developer is actually going to build for us a beach park for St. Lucians um, that use that beach there. Because those of you who know that beach, it's a little secluded. There are no facilities in there. And we want to create um, a space for St. Lucians um, to be able to continue to enjoy the beach there, but also to create economic activity um, for them. So you will see uh, facilities going up in Ridgery, Mr. Speaker, in the Mont Pimad area. You will see facilities going up in Asfair along Millennium Highway. The Bakai um, Beach Park will be totally renovated and upgraded, Mr. Speaker. Um, like I said, down Viewfort, we need to do some work in the Sandy Beach area and to do some, um, you know, development in that area. 
So there's a lot that's going to happen in the community tourism and in the restructuring of the tourism industry. The member from Beaufort North said he's excited about the future. Well, we're all uber excited about the future and the prospects that it holds for our people. And I want to thank the member from Castles, is the Prime Minister, for continuing that journey that started many years ago. And many other ministers of tourism have contributed to ensuring that we place St. Lucians at the centre of the tourism industry to be the greatest beneficiaries of the tourism industry. And this is our historic task now to take that journey a lot further than it has ever been before. My colleagues, Mr. Mr. Speaker, who continue to share the vision and support it and promote it, Mr. Speaker, that we will restructure, redesign, reorient the tourism industry and put our people first in ensuring that they can benefit from it. And our visitors who come here will have the most memorable experiences, ones that they will tell for generations to come. And that will be the foundation of success for our tourism industry. Thank you very much.